We worship this morning according to the abbreviated common service on page 15 in the front of the hymnal. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson for today is from Isaiah chapter beginning in verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is uncertain. He gives power to the faint that him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So far the Old Testament lesson. Our psalm of the day, these words of Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. So far the psalm of the day. Our epistle lesson in our continuing study of Paul's letter to the Galatians, <coughs> chapter 6, beginning in verse 20. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone, and not in his neighbor, for each will have to bear his own load. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not grow weary. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. This is the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Hallelujah. Chapter according to St. Luke, beginning at the 25th verse. 
What shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. He said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. When he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. This is the gospel of the Lord. Let us join in confessing our faith according to the words of the Nicene Creed, as printed on page 18 in the front of the hymn. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Our text in our continuing study of Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 6. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. Let's jump right into the middle of the pond here. Paul says, whatever one sows, that will he also reap. You and I might say, well, you get out of it what you put into it. Surely the great theme of Paul's letter to the Galatians is that we are saved by faith in Christ alone. But he has also made the point last week that faith in Christ is never alone. It always bears fruit. Jesus said so. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me he can do nothing. The brother of the Lord, James, in his little New Testament letter, puts it another way. Faith without works is dead. Loving God's word, living the Christian life, loving people rather than using them, these are all the vital signs of faith, the heartbeat and respiration of a real and living faith. So says Paul, one reaps what one sows. And here we see that the faith of an Abraham, the courage of a King David, the doctrinal clarity of a Paul, these things do not grow in the parched deserts of doing our own thing, living in the sins of the flesh, or loving things and using all of this poses the question, shall there be a blessed or bitter harvest? And whether there's going to be a blessed or bitter harvest first begins with how we deal with each other. Paul says, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Here Paul distinguishes between those who live in the sins of the flesh, impenitent, unrepentant, stubborn souls who have determined that they will live according to the flesh. And therefore, of course, as Paul said last week, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Let's say amen. Versus the Christian who in some moment of weakness is, as Paul words it, caught in any transgression. The word for caught has within it the idea of being taken by surprise. Paul himself describes this relentless battle between his sinful nature and the new Christian nature which the Holy Spirit has planted in him through the gospel. And so we see this everywhere, even in the great heroes of faith. Noah having too much wine in an unguarded home. Abraham trying to pass off his wife as his sister in order to avoid danger. Moses losing his patience with the people of Israel. David in a moment of leisure and his unguarded eye wandering. Elijah losing heart. Peter running scared in a moment when he thought he just couldn't handle it. All of these are examples of how Christians can get caught up and stumble and trip. 
Now says Paul, you who are spiritual, when someone is entangled, caught up in some sin, what do you do? Ignore it? A sin of weakness, which is not checked, can morph into an impenitence that becomes repetitive, going down some dangerous path. It is love that reaches out, that sends something, that tries to recall the person from their error. But he says, now, you who are spiritual, not meaning, of course, you who are better than they are, but spiritual, in the sense that you yourself know what it is to fall on your own face. You know what it is yourself to have gotten tripped up. You know what it is to have been restored by a forgiving word of God. You who are spiritual, restore such a person. The spirit of gentleness, meekness. The word for restore is the very same word the gospel used for when the disciples were mending their nets. The gentle spirit that seeks to restore a brother or sister who's gone down the wrong path is not this demeanor of better than thou, condescension, but rather one who reaches out and tries to gently mend a heart that's torn, fix what is broken, set things back in line the way they are supposed to be. So says Paul, keep watch on yourself, or you do get tempted. In the movie, The Edge, about men trapped in the Alaskan wilderness, the brilliant Charles Morris, played by Anthony Hopkins, utters a famous encouragement. He says, what one man can do, another can do. Well, now, of course, that's not entirely true because I've never been to a football like Aaron Rodgers. But what one man can do, another can do. And that became their mantra to survive the savage wilderness in the movie. Well, long before Anthony Hopkins uttered his famous encouragement. A church father named Augustine uttered a word of warning, quoted by Martin Luther, one that is always true. There is no sin that one man has committed that another man could not commit. Listen to that again. There is no sin that one man has committed that another man could not commit. We see on the news and TV people in orange jumpsuits and handcuffs and hear of horrendous crimes that make us shake our heads in disgust. And we are quite sure that we would never do something like that. And then there just has to come to mind that old line, there but for the grace of God, go I. Or we remember David on the balcony, or Peter in the courtyard, or some moment when we came awfully close to doing something. In the words of Psalm 130, Lord, Bear one another's burdens is how one edges for this blessed hearts. So fulfill the law of Christ. 
the law of Christ, the pattern, the example of Christ, the way Christ was to bear a burden. You know how Isaiah described Jesus. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried them our sorrows. Yet we considered the circuit by God sent by him afflicted, and Isaiah goes on to say, All we like sheep have gone astray, each of us turned to his own way, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity. up to the door of their suffering or their infirmity. You can perhaps peek into the house of their heart and see something of what they are enduring. But you cannot endure the side effects of the chemo or radiation treatment for them. And you gasp for air for them as their lungs fill up with fluid. <clears throat> Nor can you take to yourself the sting of their private guilt. Nor pick up their tab and take their punishment before the throne of the Most High. Only Jesus could do that. Only Jesus did. He picked up our infirmities. He carried our sorrows. He carried it all the way to the cross and to the grave in our stead. But it is a Christ-like thing. A pattern the model to be learned from Christ. Bear one another's burdens so you fulfill the law of Christ. It's a Christ like thing to ease someone else's load, to help them bear the burden, to bind up their brokenness, to help that traveler on the road to Jericho, to pour on the wine and the ointment of compassion and help on a bruised and embarrassed heart. Only you who are spiritual do that in gentleness, for there is no less harvest that ever comes from heretics. If anyone thinks he is something, says Paul, he is nothing. Let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. And each will have to bear his own load. Nothing worse than a person who is alleged in their own mind. Most of you, of course, remember the story our Lord told of the Pharisee and the publican, the tax collector. The Pharisee, of course, did not confess it. I thank thee, O Lord, that I am not as other men, even like this publican. He compared his sins, which of course makes him come out smelling like a rose. The tax collector, on the other hand, could not lift up his eyes to heaven, beat upon his breast, and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, Now this man, this crooked tax collector, went down to his house just as 
justified rather than the other. This is based nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling, said the young man. And so, Paul says, you will have a blessed instead of a bitter harvest if this is the kind of gospel ministry and preaching and teaching that you support. He says, let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. The word for taught and teaches here is a neat one. It's the word from which we get the word catechism. It refers to the oral preaching and teaching. Now says Paul in, in another place, he says in 2 Corinthians, those who preach the gospel should make their living in the gospel. Jesus said the laborer is worthy of his hire. Now certainly, the show business for Jesus' phonies, who milk orphans and widows for all they can get for their lavish lifestyles. These are a disgrace to Christ's church and to his gospel. But as Martin Luther liked to point out, so is the church that used to be able to fill the bellies of ten fat monks. But now that it has the pure gospel, can't support one preacher or teacher to do it. A blessed harvest, says Paul. Here's the principle behind it. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. The one who sows to the Spirit will from that Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Every farmer understands this principle about sowing and reaping. What farmer sows six ounces of seed and then thinks that he's going to have a big harvest in the fall? Paul once said, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. This is axiomatic. It's just the way things are, says Paul. And you farmers know that. Yes, there are risks involved, right? Seed is expensive. It's an investment. And then you farmers, you do something really interesting. You take this expensive seed and you throw it in the dirt. And you leave it there, thinking something's going to happen. Now there are risks, of course. As we see this summer, drought may wither. Too much sun may scorch it. Too much rain may rot it. Driving winds and hail may destroy it. Insects may devour it. But you do not, for that reason, refuse to plant the seed. You don't throw a bucket on a seed on a big field and say, that's good enough. You understand that there is a risk involved, but you also understand that if you want to reap, you're going to have to sow. So is it, says Paul, so in every other area of life. We plant, we sow a lot of things, don't we, in terms of education and athletics and entertainment. Or worse yet, we sow a lot of wild oats to please the flesh. Well, God is not mocked. Literally, you can't turn your nose up at God and then think there are going to be no consequences to this. Only do not become weary as you plan. Get tired. Because you don't see the immediate results as you plan for God's in your homes and in your church. Don't grow weary in doing the good things, he says. In due time, in God's time, we will reap if we do not give up. Don't grow tired because all of these people who are around you, especially those who are of the household of faith, they are opportunities for the 
kind of love that results in a blessed harvest and the path on which we are going by faith in Christ and eternal life. The prophet had it right. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk. Peace of God which surpasses all understanding will keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us offer up a prayer on the occasion of the 102nd birthday of Helen Bezessi. We pray, Lord of love, we thank you for the 102 years of grace you have granted to your servant. We praise you for being with her in good days and bad, in joy and sorrow, sickness and health. We praise you above all for having provided her with the rich comfort of your word and sacraments. Continue to make these treasures her joy and delight. Be her strength even when earthly strength fails. Finally bring her and all of us to the joy and glory of eternal life in your presence. Amen. Let us offer up our prayers for Robert Kruger, who is home from the hospital, and for Ron Anderson, who has had knee replacement surgery. O Lord, you are the great physician of soul and body. You chasten and you heal. We pray that you would look with mercy on your servants and restore their strength. You gave your son to bear our infirmities and sicknesses. Deal compassionately with them. Bless the medical means employed on their behalf with your healing power. We commit them to your gracious mercy and protection, for you are a faithful and merciful God for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let us also offer up our prayers uh, for the family of Sean Doring, the son of Ken and Mary Doring, who passed away in the forest, Wisconsin, this past week at the age of 44. We pray, 
Lord of love, we remember in our prayers the family of Sean Doring, who has been taken from them. We ask that you would give them the strength they need in their time of grief and comfort them with the precious assurance of your love for them in Christ Jesus. May this death remind us all of how quickly our lives here on earth come to an end. Lead us all to use the time you have given us to grow in our knowledge of you and your word. When you summon us, may we be found in sincere repentance and steadfast faith, prepared to stand before your judgment seat through the merits and righteousness of Jesus our Savior. Amen. And let us also pray for rain. <coughs> Merciful Father, once again we come before you, imploring you to remember our need for rain to revive and refresh the earth. Let not our crops wither and die for lack of moisture, but open the heavens and send rain. The conditions that threaten us make us realize that we can plant and cultivate. You alone bring growth and reduce a harvest. We ask you to graciously hear our prayer for Jesus' sake, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We continue with the communion portion of the service on the top of page 23 in the front of the hymn. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Let us pray. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this holy supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.